Hi, everyone. Welcome to our November Parent Speaker Series. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Christy Jumbowski, and I am the Prevention Program Coordinator at CTC, or Communities That Care of Greater Downingtown. And we do these almost about monthly or so uh, parent speaker events in partnership with Downingtown Area School District. And tonight we're very lucky because we have one of our collective partners be a part of the conversation, uh, is presenting and sharing with us the mock teen bedroom. Um, so just before we get started, a couple of tech things uh, to keep in mind. So this is a webinar format, so we cannot see or hear you. However, we would still like to very much interact and engage with you using the question and answer and um, chat functions at the bottom of your screen. So as we're going through, feel free to use that to ask questions. You'll also see that we'll be posting different links and resources in the chat function as well that you can click on and save for later to check in with. Um, also, listen up. So here's the deal. Tonight, as part of this presentation, the tour section of that will not be recorded. So this whole thing will be recorded for later viewing, except for the tour section. So if you want to make sure that you see that, make sure you stay here live to watch um, so that you're able to view that. So with that, I am going to pass it to our partner from Down and Town Area School District, Sarah Brooks. Thanks, Chrissy. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Brooks. I work with Student Assistance Services in Down and Town Area School District, as well as our District Wellness Committee. Um, I want to thank you for joining us. And if anyone else is struggling with how early it is getting dark, um, I feel <laughs> your pain because <laughs> it's November 8th and it was dark at 530. Um, so if you've joined us for past presentations, we certainly thank you for joining us again this evening um, and hopefully you'll find the information informative. I will say um, I've actually been familiar with Kim Porter and be a part of the conversation for quite some time. Um, so I'm quite excited to be able to host this event in partnership with CTC this evening. Um, I think there will be a lot of really new and relevant information that I hope you as parents find of value. Um, before I turn it over to Kim, she is the executive director of Be a Part of the Conversation, a nonprofit organization whose mission is to equip families and communities with the skills and resources to understand substance use and addiction and related health issues. She is a certified family recovery specialist and is trained to help families move into and through the recovery process through sharing her personal experience. She is the parent of someone in long-term recovery, which led her to explore the impact of addiction and individuals within their families. She has been to be a part of the conversation since 2011. And with that, I will turn it over to Kim. Thanks so much, Chrissy and Sarah. Appreciate it. Love being with you guys. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and jump right in. Okay, can you guys give me a thumbs up if you can see that? Let me expand my screen. Great, okay, there we go. All right, thanks so much. So uh, here we are, be a part of the conversation back in the good old days when we were in the room with people. Um, we're gonna get started with, um, as Chrissy said, a tour of our mock teen bedroom. And this is when the recording is going to stop because we want to not, we, we know that our kids can find out how to, you know, do a lot of, use a lot of substances and, and hide things and all that by Googling it, by getting on YouTube, we don't wanna be the source of that information for them. So that's why we've asked that this part not be recorded. But what you're gonna see is um, a video. It'll take about 20 minutes. It'll be shared on my screen. And then I'm gonna come back in and follow it up with some discussion. But normally we would be doing this um, in, a, in a community setting, have our little mock teen bedroom set up. This is not something we invented. Um, a lot of different organizations do it, but we feel like when we share some of this information, we then need to support it with, well, now what do I do if I'm a parent and I find some of these um, kinds of evidence of substance use? So I'll go ahead and start playing now. So there's a lot there. I, I cringe every time I hear myself make the mistake of saying that you would cook something in that foil and then snort or inject it. You certainly wouldn't snort something that was cooked in foil. I don't know why I said that, but I, I took all the stuff down before I realized I made that mistake. So just a little correction there. Sorry about that. So um, a lot of stuff to unpack there. Obviously, it shows progression from, you know, things that are found over the counter all the way through some pretty heavy illicit substance use. Uh, but, you know, I share all that just to um, help folks to become aware of what some of these warning signs might be. But first, let me just back up a little bit and tell you just a tiny bit about myself and why I got into this work. 
Um, the reason is I'm a parent and uh, Sarah read my bio and mentioned that I have a son in recovery. This is Daniel um, and his fiance, Chloe. He is, uh, he just turned 33 years old. Uh, he got sober about 11 and a half years ago. We're very, very fortunate that he found recovery and has hung in there in spite of the fact that he lives in Colorado, one of the states that absolutely embraces cannabis use, which was one of his favorites, but he is a lover of the outdoors and that's why he's out there um, and very happy for him. But I'm gonna spin back the clock a little bit and share this photo, which is when he was 14 years old. There he is with his dad and his sister. He, had, he was in the um, uh, jazz ensemble in middle school. We went out to Baskin Robbins after the concert, like families do. And why this photo is meaningful for this conversation is the first time Daniel got high, he was 13. It was a year before this photo was taken. So, you know, look at that sweet young boy there. And he already had been, um, had a year of, of cannabis use under his belt. We knew absolutely nothing about his substance use until he was 18. Um, and I, I shared this recently with Chrissy um, and the CTC when I was doing the podcast with them that I think she'll mention later. So sorry for repeating myself, but I worked from home as a graphic designer for my, most of my life. Um, and his, the, his dad's a physician, very well educated, knowing about things like changes. He's a neurologist, very tuned into things about brain behavior. Um, and I was home and school parent on and on, you know, active and involved in their lives. And yet we completely missed this until he was 18 years old. He got sober at 21. Those last three years of his use were pretty devastating for us as a family. Um, so I wish I knew so much, which is why I've been doing this work for the last 10 or 11 years. And um, we know that educating parents is crucial, which is why I'm so grateful to every one of you who's with us, who is a parent or an educator or a grandparent or just cares about kids as a guardian, anything at all. Thank you so much for being here because our kids who um, learn about this risks of substance use from their parents are 50% less likely to misuse substances. So being informed is really everything. We know that if you begin using a substance before you're the age of 18, you have a one in four chance of developing a problem with substances. If we wait until we're over the age of 21, that risk is reduced to one in 25. So the odds just get so much better if we can delay the onset of use. That's what prevention is all about, is delaying the onset of use, giving this very important organ in our body, that brain, lots of time to, to develop healthy coping mechanisms. Um, the, the brain develops relatively the same way for everyone from the back to the front. The, um, the parts of the brain that are like the accelerator of the car, if the brain was a car, are working really well the motivation, the risk-taking, the sponge-like need to learn things. Those are good things to have, but it also puts our kids, um, any of us when we're young at risk of, of taking chances that aren't necessarily the best in our best interest. Um, but that the brakes the, of, our, of our car brain, <laughs> the prefrontal cortex where we have executive function, um, this is probably a bad idea. Maybe I better think this through. That's not fully formed until we're roughly 25 years of age. So we have quite a way to go and we're teenagers before we have the, the full capacity to make really healthy decisions about uh, some of these risks that young people like to take or tend to take. Uh, so I like to think of the brain as wet cement, you know, it leaves, we leave footprints that remain after it's hardened. So if we can walk on dry cement, that, that doesn't leave any footprints. And alcohol can act a lot like this um, in the same way with the adolescent brain, leaving really profound damage because that brain is still developing other substances as well. Um, whereas adults whose brains are developed can can also be harmed by some of these substances, but they're not nearly as vulnerable as we are when we're young. And just in general, why is it that some people do become addicted and others don't? There are basically three legs to this stool. Uh, one is genetics. So that might be taking a look at the family tree to see, is there any alcoholism, drug addiction, gambling, shopping, any other kinds of process addictions that might put um, the family at risk? 
for this kind of substance use. Um, psychosocial emotional, so mental health diagnoses like ADHD, um, depression and anxiety, um, trauma can certainly play a very big role in those kinds of factors, risk factors. And then environment, you know, what is the access to substances, whether it's in the home, the community, the friend group, the peers, and so on. Um, and again, all of this is exacerbated by the age of the onset of use. So I thought we could sort of talk about some different categories of substances and what we're seeing. And just, you know, we could talk all night about every one of these, but I'll be kind of brief on each. Um, alcohol is still the most misused substance by young people or used substance by young people. Um, we know that it's getting better. We look at the trends through the Pennsylvania Youth Survey or PAYS, also um, a national survey called Monitoring the Future. And those both bear out the fact that kids are seeing the risks of drinking while under the influence of alcohol. Binge drinking they see is very risky. So when that perception of risk is rising, then the use is declining, which is really great. Um, and we, we parents can be a huge influencer in these decisions that they're making, whether or not to use substances. So, you know, when mom or dad, um, the parents have had a rough day, are they saying, you know, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm so stressed out, I'm going to pour a glass of wine or get me a beer or whatever. You know, there's, there's just, we need to really be thoughtful about the language that we're using, you know, no judgment about someone or the age of 21 who's able to manage their, their alcohol consumption. But just, again, the, the messaging that our kids are hearing, um, you know, when other adults are around is the first thing we say when they walk in the door, what can I get you to drink? You know, because our kids want to emulate us. We all wanted to be grownups when we were little. And that's, that's a sure sign of being a grown up is having alcohol. So it doesn't help that social media posts can be, um, funny, but kind of a bad message when you're a parent exhibiting, you know, this is like just validating the use, telling the world that I think this is cute and funny and it's totally, totally acceptable. And it's what I do to get through all this. A lot of, a lot of this has to do with COVID, as you can see. So many with COVID. I remember seeing a lot of these during COVID. Right, right. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just, it was in basically told the world this is what we need to do to get through this, right? Yep. Well, and studies show, I think I want to say, Kim, you might, might know better off the top. I, I want to say like alcohol sales from like March from over the year increased by like hundreds of percentages, like it, it skyrocketed too. So there was the marketing of it and then the stats that kind of back it up to show, so. There is a lot of research about that. And in fact, um, in our alcohol program where we focus on this, we show that it, particularly in adult women, it has increased pretty dramatically. I don't find it terribly surprising. I think particularly um, women working from home, raising kids, you know, kind of wearing a lot of hats, um, stress levels are up. It's really, truthfully, not very surprising, but, it, but it's just something to be wary of and concerned about. Um, this is a meta-analysis of a number of different studies that looked at what influences a child's decision to drink or not to drink, and parents are clearly the number one influencer across the board among all these studies. So um, I've heard so many times parents say, well, I'd rather they drink at home. I'd rather it be with us, you know, we'll, or if they have friends over, we made sure the other parents knew we were gonna get them some beer, we'll take their keys. All of those may sound like reasonable assumptions, but it, actually there's loads of research that says this is not a, a good idea. This is not a protective factor. In fact, quite the contrary, the message to kids is we're okay with you using drugs and alcohol. That's selective listening. They don't really get the part that, oh, just with mom and dad, who, by the way, who wants to only drink with mom and dad? You know, um, I remember my son saying to me in his, his, post uh, addictive years, you know, when he was in recovery, you know, all those contracts and things, who wants to say, come and get me, I've had too much to drink. You know, they don't want their parents to see them um, intoxicated. And so they'd much rather do it behind the scenes with the friends. So um, there's, a, there's a lot of science behind the fact that we can't legally drink until we're 21 probably should be 25, but that's not going to change. But um, but please know that this is just not a, um, a way to, to keep kids safer. It's just more, in fact, in a, um, 
as I said, um, you know, validate that use. So there's this 80-20 rule in marketing um, that basically says that 80% of people who go to, uh, people who, uh, the, the hamburgers consumed at McDonald's are consumed by 20% of the people who go to McDonald's. So if you go to McDonald's twice a year, McDonald's doesn't care about you. They're not after your business. They want the folks who are making up the majority of their sales, that 80% of their sales is roughly 20% of their, of their patrons. The same applies for the alcohol industry. They know that um, someone having, you know, two margaritas a, the, a year is not going to be their target audience. They want somebody who's drinking heavily, regularly, and um, they do know that that young people are part of that population. Unfortunately, they don't market to kids the way they used to, but it's definitely something to be wary of. More of that in just a moment as we're moving into cannabis and, and all of these things. So I know you've all heard quite a bit over the last five or six years about, about vaping. Um, this has introduced, uh, reintroduced a substance that we were very successfully getting kids away from, which is nicotine. So these are the top five, roughly top five most addictive substances. They can vary. This list can shift based on potency and the way it's delivered. Um, but nicotine is one of our most addictive substances. And through excellent efforts in prevention and education, we have moved kids away from those traditional combustible tobacco cigarettes um, that we thought were really cool when I was a kid. Um, but guess what came along you know, to change all of that was jewel, vaping, all the things that you saw in the mock teen bedroom. You know, we know that they're alluring to kids. Um, they, they're getting them from older siblings and friends, vape shops. Um, be wary of packages being delivered to your home. Basically, all you have to do is get online, click a button that says, yeah, I'm over the age, and you can order some of these products online. So gift cards can be a little bit problematic too. Um, if your child has a, a gift card for just like, you know, Visa or Amex or something like that, there's no way for you to know what chargers are coming through on that. So they can use that to buy products online. Um, whereas if you're getting them a gift card to their favorite clothing store, you don't have to worry about that. So just a little cautionary note about that. Kim, can I interrupt you for one second? I know our, our setup is with Zoom right now. I don't think, I don't, you, I can't see you. I think it's just the speaker who you can be seen. Um, but just along with that, as far as things getting delivered on that last slide that you were just showing, somebody mm -hmm. share in the chat that um, they have experienced or, or observed that kids will buy cannabis off of Snapchat and then people will drop it off like DoorDash at the door. And most, and I, yeah. So, yes, Snapchat. Hmm. It's true. So. And TikTok. And yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, there, there's, it's the easiest thing in the world. I mean, I, I think you can ask a, a good number of the student population, and they'll tell you that it's very easy to get your hands on this stuff. So, uh, even edibles that I mentioned in the mock team bedroom, you know, that are not legal in the state. Our law enforcement are, folks are saying, oh, they're out there. Believe me, they're, they're definitely out there as well as folks in treatment will tell you that kids are using edibles in this state. So um, yeah, there, there, well, there's a will, there's a way, unfortunately. And there are folks who love an opportunity to sell it. Um, and a lot of medical marijuana is being diverted as well. So the more access there is through medical marijuana cards, um, the more diversion there is, meaning that it's now being, you know, put out there in the market, just as um, someone with a prescription for Adderall might be uh, tempted to sell it to friends or opioids after oral surgery or something like that. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. And also, oh, mm -hmm. sorry, we have a, a question just to, that goes along with vaping. So I wanted to ask, since we're talking about that right now, someone asked the legal age to purchase for vape products and also how are teens getting this? Uh, so 20, it was 18, now it's 21. Um, so they did, they did change that recently and they get it from older siblings from, um, you know, there's always, somebody's got a cousin or somebody who's over the age of 21 who can get these things and uh, same, same as they would alcohol or anything else that shouldn't be available. Um, mm -hmm. And there are um, not necessarily with nicotine products, but when we get into cannabis here, because um, and any age in the state of Pennsylvania can now 
if they qualify for medical condition, can have a caregiver um, get the medical marijuana card. So um, that process means basically getting getting a, a physician who has been certified to approve the card. They're not giving you a prescription, they're approving a card. So if you're um, under 18, you would have to have a caregiver, meaning like a parent or guardian who has the card on your behalf. So we know that there are kids as young, well, even, even a three-year-old, I heard somebody who owns a dispensary talk about the fact that their youngest client was three and that was for a seizure disorder. Um, so that they are able to get them at young ages, but <clears throat> even teens who might be expressing um, feelings of anxiety or pain from an injury or whatever, if they qualify for that card, then their caregiver can take the card, go to the dispensary, and then someone at the dispensary helps them choose products for the young person. Um, then there's this whole Safe Harbor Act where the school nurse might work with the caregiver to dispense this. It's a very complicated thing these days. Um, there are so many challenges with this, uh, but but there that that's all being diverted to. So these cartridges that I showed in the mock teen bedroom, um, we're hearing that that people are finding them, you know, in the schoolyards. They're around, so that's what they're selling at the dispensaries a lot. Those cartridges that have cannabis oil or THC or CBD oil in them for, for um, smoking. You're not currently in Pennsylvania allowed to smoke the dried leaf plant, um, the bud, but you can, um, oils, tinctures, things like that are available. I could talk about that all night, but I'll go into a little bit more about cannabis and how it's changed over the years. I like to say, not only is this not your, your mom and dad's weed, this isn't your older siblings weed. This is, um, I mentioned that my son got sober 11 years ago. Uh, wax products, dabs, concentrates weren't even around then. He's never even used those products. So it's changed quite a bit in a very short period of time. And you can see this is from the department, uh, the DEA um, uh, Drug uh, Enforcement Agency that the blue line is showing THC um, potency versus CBD. So there are hundreds of chemicals in the cannabis plant. When it's dried, there are hundreds more. When it's dried and lit on fire, there are hundreds more. It's all chemistry, kind of getting all these different um, molecules activated. Um, the two that are very interesting to us are THC and CBD. CBD does not get you high. There are CBD products made from hemp that have traces of THC in it, um, but they're probably not going to get you high. It's this, it's this change in potency. So when you have a one-to-one -one ratio of CBD and THC, you don't get very high. That's how the plant was in its natural state. But through botany and hybridizing and all of that, um, we know that, that the potency is really increasing. I'll go over that in just a moment, but you can see here just from 1995 through 2018, how much it's changed. So here's the flower that actually looks nothing like it did back when you bought marijuana 20, 30 years ago. It's really been, um, these buds have gotten so much larger, which is where the potency has been increasing. And then this is one of the ways that the concentrate can look. So concentrates are basically taking that dried plant, packing it in like a tube or something like that, flushing it with a, with a solvent such as butane, which strips the THC from the plant and condenses it, cooks it down, by the way, a very volatile process that, that can be um, super flammable and there have been fires because of this, uh, but cooks it down into this kind of waxy looking substance. Um, and just to give you an idea of the difference in potency, again, this, this green section is just looking at the dried plant back in the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s, no more than 3% THC. The average level of the plant today is about 13%. They've gotten it through science, through botany, up to about 30% THC. Um, but that's where it kicks into high gear when you get into concentrates. So here's a cartridge. Again, these, these different products, just give you a glimpse of some of these different products. Um, that come from these concentrates, but they can be up to 80, 85, even 90 or 95% THC. 
um, edibles. As I said, they're not here yet in Pennsylvania, um, but they present a huge problem because they aren't, they're metabolized much more slowly because we're eating them. They're going through the digestive system. So you might eat some edibles wanting to get high, um, not feel it, think, oh, I'm not feeling this. I'm going to eat some more. By the time you're feeling high, you're feeling pretty toxic because you might even be overdosing on THC, which is a possibility. Overdose does not necessarily mean death. Overdose means that you're, you've become toxic from whatever the substance is um, and you're having some health problems. So also a problem when young people, very young people who don't know that these aren't gummy bears or brownies or whatever the product is, gets their hands on them. Obviously that presents a whole nother set of problems. So again, these are some of the, I mean, good heavens, look at these crystals that come from the cannabis plant. So a lot of, a lot of science going into getting these concentrated and very high in potency. So roughly, um, if, we're, if we're any of us 12 and older who use cannabis regularly, about 9% of us will develop cannabis use disorder. Um, if we're under 18, we're four to seven times more likely in that isolated 12, younger age um, to have a problem with cannabis use disorder. I'm, I'm going to do some more research on this because just recently someone pointed out to me that there are more studies that show these numbers are actually higher than this. Um, that more people than 9% are becoming um, addicted to cannabis. Cannabis can have a lot of different effects on the brain, on our, our the way we process it, the way we feel it. It can depend on the plant. Does it come from the sativa plant, the indica plant? Is it um, the way we're, it's being delivered? And also what is our body chemistry and how we're responding to it? In some cases, it will feel, the high will feel like a stimulant. Um, it'll be very uh, energizing. In others, it will be a depressant or a mellowing effect. And in others, it feels like a hallucinogen or a dissociative kind of out-of-body effect. So it can be very different depending on a lot of things. Um, some trends that we know we have to worry about is again, that, um, that, that lowered perception of harm, the opposite of what we saw with alcohol is a lowered perception of harm because of all of the legalization. So we know that use is going up access in the home, um, just as we had, we know that um, when young people were especially misusing um, prescription medications like opioids and amphetamines and other things, the number one place they got them was the medicine cabinet. So if there's more cannabis in the home, we're gonna see more use among youths, youth, young people. Um, legalization, obviously, if we get to adult use being legalized, there'll be even more access. And then again, that lower perceived harm, potency going up, um, big challenges with workplace. How do you, you deal with you know truck drivers who have chronic pain who are using medical marijuana? It presents a lot of problems. There is no field sobriety test for cannabis as there is for alcohol. So that can be very challenging. You need to do blood work to really determine. And that is very um, uh, non-conclusive because it doesn't tell us um, when somebody was using it, it stays THC when used heavily stays in the system for quite a while. There's also something to be aware of called cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. This is a condition where heavy cannabis use might lead to excessive vomiting. They call it scrometing because you feel like screaming and you're vomiting. At the same time, <clears throat> emergency departments are seeing more and more of this. Um, parents are very flummoxed by why is it my child can't stop vomiting and almost instinctively um, folks who are going through this will take a hot shower or hot bath, which seems to be the one thing that that helps this to subside. Um, but that's kind of universal that hot shower hot bath helping with this, but just again something to be aware of. <clears throat> there very definitely are withdrawal symptoms from cannabis use um, that are physical, including some of the things that you see here. Um, these symptoms can last for one to two weeks. The, the, the longer someone and the more, more uh, intensely someone's been using it, the longer the effects will last. We talked earlier a little bit about, about marketing and how much uh, young people are targeted. Um, this is something back in my day that, can, that, that Joe Camel was used as a way to lure kids into wanting to smoke cigarettes and be super cool, um, you know, introducing us now to, as we saw the Lucy sticks and, and all the edibles and, 
you know, they're, I hate to tell you, but they're vultures out there, guys. These, these, uh, the, the cannabis industry is now big tobacco. You know, what big tobacco was, Altria, Philip Morris are buying up all of these products and um, they know who to go after. So that 80 20 rule applies here as well. They want people to love these products and they're going to go after them. Just a little note that. We all know that recreational use is something that's that may be coming along in Pennsylvania. We don't know for sure, but it, it, it may be a fait accompli. Um, but please let's all as adults get in the habit of calling it adult use rather than recreational use. Kids don't need to hear us talking about this as recreational. That sounds just way too healthy and fun. Um, so if we can change that language, I think that would be a good thing. Just a little note on something that a survey <clears throat> done annually by monitoring the future um, through the National Institutes on, uh, on uh, the National Institute on Drug Abuse. Um, they made note of a very disconcerting trend that they saw among eighth graders in particular. So it's just very interesting. The blue line shows uh, the use of cough medicine over a five year period among eighth graders. The orange section is amphetamines and the yellow section are inhalants. So huffing things like what you saw in the bedroom, um, like dust off or the top of a ready whip can, those sorts of things, or those whippets. Uh, just really odd that eighth graders in particular, you can see how dramatically um, the use has risen over the last five years. Just wanted to make a note about that. So again, please keep medications locked up in the home, even over the counter, like those products that have dextromethorphan, cough medicines, all of that really should be um, kept safely locked away. <clears throat> and when no longer needed, expired or not, not needed any longer, please take them to, most police precincts have these drop boxes where they can be disposed of. I'm so worried I'm going over time here. I'll try to speed things up. Um, tips for parents. So staying connected. Um, the teenage years can be really tumultuous. Please take some time to just be light and have fun with our kids. Um, let them contribute ideas to holiday plans, weekend activities. Um, what, do you, what do you think? What should we make for dinner? You know, just keeping it light instead of lots of heavy conversations, which tend to come up a lot during those years. I love the idea of, just as we said earlier, not reaching for the alcohol or verbalizing why we're reaching for the alcohol, but rather saying, you know what? I've had the most stressful day. I think I'm gonna go take a walk. Do you wanna come with me? Um, or I'm so sick of looking at screens. You wanna play a game of cards with me or, or just sit in and you know um, play Monopoly, whatever. You know, Just come up with some ideas to show I'm gonna take care of myself in a healthy way and model that for our kids. And I mentioned earlier about that brain development and the brain not being fully developed until we're 25. No young person wants to hear that. Instead, I think we can have a very positive message about <clears throat> what a great time this is for them to build great chemistry in their brains. Boy, you have such a good opportunity to fire those, um, those neurons in a really positive way. Um, you know, we, when we use substances, it's really for pleasure and not long-term happiness. So I love this, I just heard this today in a, in a training that I was in. And so I click through it onto this slide um, from, from Bruce Perry, who is the founder of the Child Trauma Academy in Houston, Texas. He said, wouldn't it be great if all of our behaviors were respectful of our biology? So, you know, not technology, not sugary foods, not smoking cannabis, not, drinking alcohol, you know, these are not respectful of our biology. What can we do to respect our health and our bi biology? So having tough conversations, if we need to, if we get there, um, please think about, are you ready to have a tough conversation? If your son or daughter or loved one is under the influence, not the time to have the conversation. If you are extremely angry or fearful or upset, <clears throat> not the time to have the conversation. Um, this is probably what I looked like when my son was under the influence and I wanted to lecture and I did lecture. I wish I knew this acronym that we all love so much these days. Wait, why am I talking? I really am not in the right place to have this conversation. I would much rather listen 
now that I understand all of this, you know, listen and do more listening, um, be ready to hear some hard things. So being really mindful of um, how we're responding when we're listening to them. Um, an opening statement might be, please help me to understand, dot, dot, dot. Help me to understand why you won't stop vaping. Help me to understand why you're not making hunt home by curfew, you know, um, and, and give them an opportunity to share. And then again, being really mindful about how we're responding to this. Am I, you know, angry? Am I showing it in my face? Am I interrupting? Um, we want to be, we want the conversation to keep going. We want there to be honesty um, and consistency and follow through with the other parent as much as possible. Being on that same page is really important. Uh, we all know what helicopter parents are, I'm sure, you know, the hovering, being heavily involved. Um, but I think this snowplow parenting is something that we need to be very wary of as well. We don't like to see our kids in pain. And so we want to take away any obstacles that get in their way or challenge them, challenge them. So, you know, let's not rob, rob them of that chance to grow. I think we've all probably grown from hard things in our lives. And our kids, you know, once the scaffolding, if we're the scaffolding around them, once we're not there any longer, we want them to be able to find help um, under their own steam and, and know how to, how to take care of themselves without us fixing all of their problems. Um, asking for help through therapy, um, talking to someone. If I don't understand what is going on with my child, then I don't think I can possibly be of much use to them unless I take care of myself. So kind of putting that oxygen mask on myself first, taking a breath um, and getting some help, talking to someone who can help, um, whether it's through the school system. Um, you know, shout out to, to Sarah Brooks who's on with us because she's, you know, she is there for your students. Her and all the folks, whether it's with student assistance program, with guidance, um, with all of the other resources that are available at Downingtown School Districts, um, you know, there are so many people who want your child to succeed and do well in school. And that means emotional support, that means support with substance use and so on. Um, and connecting with other families is very important too. Um, I don't know what I would do without my people. My people are other parents who have um, identified that their child has a substance use problem. Uh, we have these meetings that take place throughout the region. I say region, but they're mostly on Zoom right now. Um, this is on our website. Um, you can see all of these green buttons are Zoom meetings. The purple buttons are um, in person. It's one hybrid meeting, but basically we, we're here four nights a week uh, throughout the, the year, uh, talking to each other, giving each other support and resources. And I'm gonna stop sharing. I can get out of this. Let's see. There we go. I'm sorry I talk so long. You were great. <laughs> and Chrissy, you're muted. <laughs> well, that happened to me earlier after the end of the tour. I wanted to chime in and say, Kim, if you could have seen my face, <laughs> if we were in person or if I was on the side of the screen, as you were going through the tour of everything, my face was pretty much like this entire time because I've not seen it before. So I'm just the same as everyone out there viewing tonight. Um, and I mean, between the water bottles and all the things you can buy online and just, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot, it's a lot. And, and, and Snapchat and TikTok. So it's like the things in the room and the things in the phone, it's just a lot. Um, so I, Kim, I did have a question I wanted to ask. Um, just, and, and as I'm asking if other folks want to chime in and put something in the chat or the question and answer function. Um, so you talked about snowplow parents and we all know about helicopter parents. So I guess, I think something that maybe some parents struggle with or something that's a common question is, okay, you want your kids to have their own space and you want to trust them. But how much do you, like, what was you, where's the line or the in-between of, going in and, and, you know, they might say, you snooped through my room, you went through all my stuff, but you're like, I love you and want to make sure that you're safe. So like, how do you balance those two things? Do you know, you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Like, I'm not a helicopter parent, but I also need to go through your stuff. So like, what's that? How do you walk that line? 
Right. Well, I think a helicopter parent is the one who's like, you know, making sure that did you get your paper done? Did you, you know, let me check your grades. Let me make sure, you know, I remember college applications. I knew all my son's deadlines way better than he did. That was helicoptering. Mm -hmm. I don't Mm -hmm. think that being thoughtful and concerned is being a helicopter parent. I think that's being a parent. Um, And, you know, trust your kids to be kids. Trust your kids to make mistakes just as you did. You know, um, we, we are parents for a reason, you know, and there's a progression, you know, we we're not going to be a parent the same way we were when they were five than when they're 15. Um, But we can, you know, it is our home. Um, We have every right to make sure we don't have anything illegal in the house that that when their friends are coming in, we have the right to check their friends backpacks. Sorry if it's embarrassing guys, but you know what our kids have hopefully hundreds of opportunities to make friends, they get one or two shots at a parent, you know, and, and that's our, that is our role until they are ready to um, go off and be adults. And so, you know, I, there's a, there's a fine line, you know, you want to, to foster that communication and the openness. Um, So I think that we want them to tell us about mistakes that they've made. So even as we're modeling healthy things like I need to go take a walk and that kind of stuff. We can also model things like, you know, I think I, I shouldn't have put that thing out there on social media. I think I might've embarrassed my best friend. I'm going to call her and make some amends. I think that can be even a way of showing um, it's okay to make a mistake. I'm not going to judge you. I'm just going to be curious, you know, about why it is that this is, this is going on. Um, Sarah, I defer to you. I'm sure you have some thoughts about this. Well, I think the other piece in my mind is also sometimes context. And, and so much of what you've offered today resonates in so many places, even to be truthful without knowing it, you, you even highlighted some of the things we spoke about in our last parent speaker event. And just in terms of how to create space for hard conversations at an early age, um, with even more frequency, just how to push into some of those places that sometimes are uncomfortable and really trying to create a narrative so that we're not all of a sudden finding ourselves in a situation as a parent of a 16 year old, like we never talked about this or now my child won't talk to me. Um, But I think the other piece is, you know, as you're talking about some of that, it's also paying attention to other potential changes. If you're concerned about your child or a loved one, I would say, you know, some of the questions that always come to my mind when I've talked to parents in the past are, you know, are there other changes that you've noticed if you're concerned about whether or not your child is using substances and they haven't shared that information with you? Not, not only like finding things in the, in the bedroom, but potentially how are they doing in school? Um, have you noticed changes in their behavior? Do you find that they're not really co- attending to the same things that they used to? A big one that I have often asked is like, do you know their friends anymore? Um, because sometimes what I've found, especially amongst high school kids, is there's sort of a transition. And yes, we want to foster their independence and their development. But when a parent says to me, I don't know my kids' friends anymore, that's kind of concerning in my mind. Um, so I think. Those are also pieces that we want to try and be mindful as we're trying to sort of support our kids through these sometimes challenging years. Um, It's definitely, it's it's a process um, as you've already highlighted tonight and certainly for anyone who's joining us this evening, we certainly appreciate your willingness to just learn more and and listen because that's a big part of it. I mean, I think back to students that I've known over the years and you shared your story about your son I have known so many kids who similarly have shared their first use was in those middle school years. Um, And it was often just exposure with a sibling or somebody else had an older sibling or somebody had access to something. And, you know, there were instances where something may have started innocently and it wasn't going to be something problematic. And then it grew to be something problematic. Um, So I certainly over the years have known kids who struggled. Um, And then I also have known kids who've managed to get clean and have embraced recovery. Um, I think the other piece that you've highlighted, which I would echo, um, and I know that there are a number of wonderful parent support groups in our area. um, And that piece is huge, in my opinion. Um, I've known so many parents who 
have struggled to get their kids to engage in treatment or recovery. But I think if they've found a space to be able to talk to other parents and be really open um, and honest, just having that support for themselves has been huge um, and can sometimes really also help to bring the floor up from a treatment perspective to try and really engage and motivate a young person to get the help they need. Um, I think somebody put in the chat a question about yeah, where to find yeah. resources. Yeah, there, there was that question. Yeah, you wanna do that? There's also like a question and answer question. So um, do that one, Sarah, yeah. So someone asked, where can parents find additional support and resources to navigate substance abuse? Um, Kim, I'll let you go first. <laughs> Um, so uh, I won't talk and type at the same time, but I'll, I'll put in the chat a link to our where you can find those support groups that I showed that calendar. I'll put that link out there. Um, they're, they're not going to necessarily nav help you to navigate the substance abuse, but they're going to be there as a support for you for as family members. Um, but as far as assessments, I mean, that's that's Sarah's bailiwick, you know, as far as if they're you know, K through 12 student, then there are lots of resources in the district. And let me just say too, um, because Sarah brought up the support groups, um, I have noticed a huge, and this is completely anecdotal, this is not scientifically based, but I have noticed a huge shift in the population attending our support groups to younger parents of younger kids who are very engaged with cannabis use. And I just want to put that out there because um, while we know that not every student is doing this, certainly not, and if, and if your child is telling you everyone gets high, it's actually not true. Um, most kids are not getting high, but there is an, an uptick that I'm seeing, and also so many of the therapists who work with adolescents are, are expressing the same thing. Um, if you're seeing this, you are not alone. Um, it's very confounding um, because we might also have our peers as adults saying, it's just weed. Um, I had a therapist, my, you know, my son saw a therapist who, who said that it's just weed. I mean, there's a lot of misinformation out there about this. It's a very complex topic. It is not the devil's botany by any means, but it is problematic. It can be problematic and it's complicated. So just know if you're seeing this, you're not alone. Um, and there are a lot of resources, but Sarah, do you want to talk about the resources at school services. Yeah, yeah, I can speak to some of the services through the district. And then I think the only other piece that I was going to echo to your point, Kim, um, I think there's an acknowledgement um, in the treatment community, I'll say. Um, when I first started in the field, I think mental health and drug and alcohol work were also very often very siloed, like mental health lived over here and drug and alcohol lived over here. Um, and I think in my years and my experience, there's been a real shift and, and growth in my opinion and an acknowledgement that the two are often much more connected um, and happen simultaneously in some instances. So I think a lot of like the providers that I'm familiar with and work with often have potentially experience working both with mental health and then additionally mm -hmm. substance abuse or addiction providers specifically who are really pretty well versed um, and in tune with co-occurring mental health diagnoses potentially. Um, I think the only other thing that I was gonna add and we didn't touch in detail upon it, but um, you're probably familiar with and I've attended a webinar recently where they were talking about um, marijuana induced psychosis and mm -hmm. some of those trends that have emerged that are really very scary um, aside from what you referenced in, in the instances of vomiting, but also students who have had prolonged marijuana abuse and it's, it's really evolved to the point where it's actually developed into full psychosis, which is very scary um, in my opinion. But, um, and I, did you wanna say something to that? Yeah, cannabis? just excellent point, excellent point. I could have spent the whole time talking about cannabis. I mean, there's absolutely, if there is any family history of schizophrenia, schizophrenia or psychosis, yep. this can be a catalyst. There's not, there's not a whole lot of evidence if it's, if it's correlational or causational, but mm -hmm. there's, there's a correlation at the very least. So just to be very aware of that for sure. Thanks, Sarah. And I was going to say too, on um, just for prevention resources, but also useful links to other kind of best practice entities like SAMHSA and CADCA and CDC, um, if you go, and these links are also, should be in the email, I think that everyone got for this webinar. And also you'll get follow-up emails in the coming weeks um, or week or so. Um, 
is uh, dtownctc.org. If you go to our website and at the top it says resources and click on there, you'll see a page that has useful links, other webinars, other resources specifically for parents. Um, and there's a ton of links to other best practice resources there as well. Um, oh, oh, sorry, sorry. No, were you going to say something before I talked about that? Go to the next, I was supposed to go to the next question that someone had about cannabis, which we're talking a lot about. But were you going to say something else? I was just going to speak to our SAP teams in our school districts. But. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, no, I was just going to say, um, in regards to SAP or student assistance programs, um, in all of our buildings, grades 6 through 12. So that basically means starting at the Marsh Creek Center and then extending to all of our middle schools as well as all three high schools. Um, every building has a SAP team, which if you're not familiar with, that's, that's okay. Sometimes it's hard to find information. I realize that. Um, but your SAP team is really a team of teachers in addition to school counselors, prevention specialists who are working to support students for a variety of reasons, but those may include also difficulties with mental health and or substance abuse. So I would say if you are concerned about your child um, or if you're looking for more information, you certainly can always reach out to your school counselor. Um, you can also absolutely reach out to the prevention specialist in your building. I would say in all of those buildings, the prevention specialist is really the facilitator of their SAP teams. Um, and then additionally, we have partnerships with other community resources, such as, for example, um, just to highlight a few, Compass Mark, who's probably somewhere on the website with uh, resource information. And then additionally, we actually have a contract with Devereaux. Um, who getting back to some of Kim's points earlier, we can offer assessments. Um, if you have a concern for your child, and feel like they need to have a more sort of detailed conversation with someone to explore if mental health or drug and alcohol treatment would be helpful. Um, so yes, please don't feel, feel free to reach out. Don't hesitate. I know it's a hard conversation to, to have. I know um, there still is a, a lot of stigma attached to both mental health and substance abuse, but if you're worried about your child, these are absolutely confidential conversations, um, and we really are there to help. We have two questions. So the first one is, are there tips to help a child withdraw from, help the child withdraw from cannabis since it takes one to two, one to two weeks to withdraw? So tips for that if, it, if you have a kid that is was using, quit using, and having with having withdrawal symptoms. Right. So, um, you know, those symptoms is just again, the, you know, it's depression, anxiety, flu-like symptoms, um, feeling irritable and not sleeping well. You know, um, it, these are a very uncomfortable. They're not going to create any serious health risks. You know, this the withdrawal. There is no medication. Like there with withdrawal from opioids. Um, there are things like Suboxone to help titrate off. Um, just a note, because I always, when there's an opportunity to talk about withdrawal, two substances that are very dangerous to withdraw from are alcohol and benzodiazepines, such as Xanax or Valium. Um, they're very dangerous to detox from if, they're, if they've been <clears throat> used pretty heavily. <clears throat> If the cannabis withdrawal is just going to be very, very uncomfortable. Um, so, you know, it's really just being supportive and being grateful that they're withdrawing. <laughs> yeah. Um, someone else had a question and asked, do you have a sense for how prevalent substance abuse is in the downtown area high school? I have a freshman who is meeting new people and it's hard to get to know who she is associating with. Always a hard question to answer um, without raw numbers in front of me at the moment. The pieces that I could probably highlight are a couple things. Um, and actually Kim touched upon this a little bit earlier. One, if you're looking for our district specific Pennsylvania area youth survey data, the most mm -hmm. recent report, which was done in 2019 is actually available on our district website. Um, if you look under wellness actually, um, you can find a link to both the PAYS report and additionally our board presentation um, that was done. And then additionally, as an FYI, actually, we are just in the process of finalizing our PAYS surveys for the current school year. Uh, PAYS is something that's done every two years. Sixth, eighth, tenth, and twelfth graders participate in that survey. Um, so we are just finishing sort of this cycle of surveying now. Um, and then that data will come back to us in the spring and then we'll be sharing that with the public in the fall again. Um, what I would say, and I think Kim kind of touched upon this earlier, you know, I think a lot of times there's some misinformation and perceptions out there. Kids will make comments like everybody's doing it, everybody's smoking, everybody's doing this, everybody's doing that. Um, that's, that's not really the truth. 
Um, again, I think it comes back to obviously, you know, having conversations with your kids, trying to keep the conversation open, trying to get familiar with maybe their friends or just asking questions that kind of help you to understand who these people are. Um, those are probably some of my preliminary thoughts. <laughs> Um, and yeah, okay. I had a thought, but then I lost it. But those are the questions. So we, we are trying to have a hard stop at 815. So I want to make sure we're answering folks that are asking. Um, so someone asked, what is Downingtown Area School District doing to prevent, stop the prevalent use of cannabis vaping in the school bathrooms? I know that they've done a lot of work um, in, a ter in terms of our code of conduct. Um, and additionally, actually through our wellness committee, we have a, a subcommittee that's very committed to this drug and alcohol policy um, and vaping education and information. Obviously, um, through our health and PE curriculum, we're also providing education for students in regards to substance abuse prevention. Um, some of that, unfortunately, is probably a question easier to be answered by administrators, um, but certainly very aware. Um, that's probably the best thing I can say. <laughs> it's and the and vaping is just so it's so prevalent and it's getting kind of really speaking to the mock bedroom type of thing is that it's getting easier and easier to easier for people that might be using these products to hide their use too. And so it's just so different when we think of nicotine tobacco products where. If someone was smoking a traditional cigarette, you would know it right away. Um, that it's just, it's it's very, it's a it's it's a challenge. It's it's just a challenge. So I don't I don't I mean, yeah, it's just hard. And seeing all the things in your presentation, Kim, I was just it's like so many things. It's just it's a lot. I will say for students who are caught on school property in possession of a substance. Um, they are essentially perceived as policy violators because obviously you can't have a controlled substance on school grounds. Um, and so in most instances, if that happens, aside from the disciplinary sort of uh, suspensions that often occur, it is also a referral to our SAP team and a required assessment through our SAP liaison as well. So there is a piece of that conversation, not that I ever want it to get to that point, but if it does get to that point, um, where not only is there some discipline, but there is also the component of trying to sort of assess how significant the problem is and what services should be put in place. Okay. All right. I was just going to add to Chrissy, I know you said you had a big reaction when you were watching the bedroom and, uh, you know, that's the reason we stopped doing the bedroom um, in an isolated way, you know, um, because we, we would see parents have that freak out look on their face. Like, I think I'm seeing some of this or what would I do if I saw some of this? Um, it's like, it's gonna be okay. This is this could be hoarding food. This could be a lot of different things. It's just an indicator that your child is is find, trying to find a way to self-soothe. And, yeah. you know, yay, you found it. You know, now we have something to work with. Um, and, you know, it's not their friends, don't, it's never their friends. They're, nobody would carry cigarettes for someone else. And nobody would also have a pipe that belongs to someone, you know, so it's okay though. It's good. You're, you know, you've identified it again, put that oxygen mask on yourself first. Don't jump into that dialogue with them until you've taken a breath, really thought through what you want the next steps to be. Hopefully um, converse with the other parent. If there, if there's, is one in the family that you need to get on the same page with if at all possible. And um, and just recognize this as, you know, there's a red flag here and we, we're going to need to like talk to someone. And if you, you know, this is not something that's easy to do. Um, even, even if you're a professional who understands behavioral health, mom and dad trumps everything. Our emotions get in the way. Please don't be afraid to ask for help from someone who understands substance use. Um, this was a mistake that we made. We were too afraid to call it addiction. And instead we took our son to someone who didn't understand it, minimized it, and his use continued for another year um, because we were too afraid. I would rather have now, of course, in retrospect, rather have taken into someone who's a specialist who understands what we're seeing because I don't get it. Why would I get it? I could read all the books under the sun. I still, I'm, I'm mom and I'm emotional. I need mm. some support from somebody who understands yeah. this. And you can even say to your child, maybe I am overreacting. Let's go talk to somebody who knows more about it than I do. 
That's a good point. Yeah. Okay. So as I think, I think we're good on questions and things. So as we wrap up, um, before I pass it to you, Sarah, just to kind of give some information of other things that we have coming up, other events um, that the district is offering to the community, I would be um, I put an evaluation link in our in the chat. So if you could click on that and let us know how we're doing, we really appreciate any feedback you can give us. Um, I'll be sending up a follow up email that will have links to different resources as well um, to everything that we talked about here and, and to provide other resources. And also, um, CTC did just recently launch yesterday a podcast which very fortuitously kind of meant to be serendipitous. I don't know. Um, Kim is actually our very first guest. Uh, so I'll put a link to it if you wanted to have a listen. It's called Parent to Parent, Real Life Tips to Raise Resilient Kids. Um, and so our first episode is with Kim. Uh, so I'm going to put that a link there so that will link it to other apps and things to play it in. Um, so thanks so much, everyone, for joining us tonight. And I'm going to pass it to Sarah just to give you some dates and things to keep an eye on um, as uh, more events are coming. Thanks, Chrissy. Um, and thank you again, Kim, for everything that you shared. Um, I was really excited that we were able to coordinate the, this for this evening. And additionally, for all the parents who have viewed or are still viewing, thank you as well for just staying with us because I think the topic is so relevant um, and just having you present and listening is, is hugely helpful. Uh, a couple of pieces just coming up moving forward, just for you to sort of have on your radar. I wanted to make mention of an event actually coming up on November 22nd, actually through our DEI department. They are going to be doing an evening with the Lenape community. Um, that will be on November 22nd. It will be a virtual event. My understanding is it's from 6 to 7 p.m. There is information on our district website and also uh, through our DEI pages specifically that reference that. Um, I think I've also seen some social media posts as well. Um, I do think there is an event by, event right registration. Um, and then additionally in December coming up on December 7th, we will actually be hosting an in-person event at Downingtown West High School. Um, this will look a little bit different, but we actually are partnering with an organization um, called SAVE. Let's talk about it. And that presentation will actually include both a mental health vendor fair from 5 to 6 p.m. that evening. And then the presentation itself will take place from 6 o'clock till 8 o'clock in the evening at Downingtown West High School, um, which will also include a keynote speaker um, speaking on suicide prevention specifically, and then two panelists or actually I should say two panels that include some of our student voices and then also some adults in the community who can speak to various aspects related to mental health. So all of that information is available on our website. You may also see things through social media. Um, we are asking for registration in advance, but that December event will actually be in person. So we certainly hope to see you then. And uh, thank you again for being with us this evening. Thanks, Chrissy. Thanks, Kim. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you.